So everyone, thank you so much for attending our uh, webinar this evening entitled The Hidden Curriculum in Counselor Education Careers. My name is Dr. Marlon Johnson. I am the Professional Development Chair of Counselors for Social Justice. And we are honored tonight to have two wonderful professionals who are going to give us some incredible knowledge about both their experiences and their observations um, of this hidden curriculum. So before I introduce them, just a couple of housekeeping things. One, like I said and acknowledged, this is a recorded webinar. Uh, and so I ask that all of your uh, microphones be muted throughout the presentation. Uh, if you are curious or have questions that are coming up as this presentation goes on, uh, I invite you to use our chat feature that you can find at the bottom or the side of your screens. Uh, of course, we'll be monitoring that chat throughout. Um, but we'll also leave some time at the end of our presentation to uh, have conversation and questions throughout. Uh, without further ado, let me introduce to you uh, Drs. Dollarhide and Levine. So I will start with Dr. Allison Levine, who is an assistant professor of counseling at the University of Iowa. And Dr. Levine has been a certified rehabilitation counselor since 2012 and has worked in psychiatric rehabilitation settings, as well as in providing free employment transition services to students with autism spectrum disorders. Dr. Levine completed her doctorate in rehabilitation counselor education at Michigan State University in 2018. Dr. Levine's research uses social justice frameworks for improving counselor education and supervision, in particular with regard to professional disposition development as well as improving understandings about disability bias within the helping professions. She is currently the co-chair of the inaugural Anti-Oppressive Pedagogy in Initiative with the National Council on Rehabilitation Education. Amazing, amazing work. We're so excited to have you here. We also have Dr. Collette Dollarhide. So Dr. Dollarhide is no stranger to us in CSJ. <laughs> but she has been a counselor since, since 1988 and a counselor educator since 1995. And as a trailing spouse, she has worked at five different campuses and has held a variety of different positions in counselor ed, including adjunct, visiting professor, and tenure track professor. In addition, she has chaired and participated in dozens of search committees and served on uh, P and T committees on various campuses. We'll hear a little more about that tonight. Overall, she has served as president of two national associations and two state associations, and has published and presented on supervision, social justice, professional identity, school counseling, and counselor education. Without further ado, I will hand it over to the two of them. Uh, take it away, y'all. Thank you so much for the generous introduction. We are very happy to be here. And I'm just really glad I got introduced before Dr. Dollarhide because there's no chance that I would have been able to follow her up. I did see, I think, um, that our third presenter, uh, Dr. Kasani, maybe just jumped on. So I know she's going to be jumping in and out um, throughout our presentation. But I will go ahead and uh, share my screen here for us and hopefully this will go relatively seamlessly. Okay. So we are indeed presenting the hidden curriculum of counselor education careers. Um, this group is actually a little bit larger, I think, than uh, we had anticipated. So um, if you have questions as we move through, please um, drop them in the chat and we'll do our best to get to them in order um, but since there is going to be kind of a lot of information what we're going to try and navigate it as smoothly as possible while leaving space for dialogue so um, we're gonna we're gonna do our best uh, please be gentle with us i would say um, dr kasani if you're on if you want to just are you able to introduce yourself quickly 
So are you jump on? Hey everybody, I'm trying to navigate my video. I'm on my laptop right now and I'm not used to being on my laptop when I do Zoom. Um, <laughs> so as soon as I get my camera figured out, I will definitely come on, but welcome. So excited to see so many people here in this presentation. I hope to be able to see you very soon. <laughs> Perfect, thank you so much. Um, okay, so I will jump in and get started. Um, so our um, introductions and um, we were already uh, given such great introductions, but we um, thought it was important for everybody to, rec to know that we are three uh, very passionate counselor educators who are looking to disrupt um, some of the norms in counselor education um, that perpetuate historic oppressive practices um, and maintain hegemony in our discipline, um, especially with regard to what goes on sort of in higher education. Um, the three of us have varied experiences that we think um, will be beneficial. Um, and we, as we were preparing for this presentation, just sort of talked about how many different types of careers there are and what things look like and how much is just really unspoken and assumed, which is of course what a, a hidden curriculum is. And so we're trying to bring that to light, right? Like make the hidden known. Um, and another just sort of asterisk that I wanted to um, mention here is that um, none of this is to say that one type of career is better than another. We are trying to bring to light inequities and problems that exist within higher education, um, but not necessarily saying you need to go in this direction or this direction is bad. Um, we will be pointing out certain ways that higher education has made certain uh, pathways more difficult or less um, equitable, I'll say. Um, but we do want to be very clear. We don't believe that one is better than the other. We are just simply trying to bring information to light for all of you. Moving forward, um, so we do want, we recognize everybody is on different land. Um, by and large, most of that land is probably, has probably been um, stolen. Um, and so um, I know Dr. Dollarhide and I both um, operate out of um, land grant universities. And so we wanted to take a moment to acknowledge um, that um, much of what we know of this country today, including its culture, economic growth, and development throughout history and across time, has been made possible by the labor of enslaved Africans, their ascendants and their descendants who suffered the horror of the transatlantic trafficking of their people, chattel slavery and Jim Crow. We are indebted to their labor and their sacrifice and we must acknowledge the tremors of that violence throughout the generations and the resulting impact that can still be felt and witnessed today. Um, and especially important given that we are so early on in Black History Month. Um, and so we wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that. Um, there's additional link and information. Um, these slides will be available to everybody. So you're able to go ahead and find out more information for your own um, areas as well, if that is something that you are interested in. Um, our learning objectives for today. So we are going to define various roles in counselor education. Um, we're going to discuss uh, the advantages and disadvantages of, the, of various roles, again, not meaning to pit one against the other, certainly just to uh, shed light on things, um, including social justice implications of each. Um, and it, this is sort of the first time I've seen a discussion like this personally. Um, I'm relatively new um, as a counselor educator, and I always say that, and I then I like increasingly get uh, further and further into my career, and I realize I'm not as new as I think I am. <laughs> um, but we will also then present some tips and resources for evaluating options and job offers in counselor education. Um, and so I'm gonna open, I'm seeing a chat, so I'm going to, okay. Oh, thank you. Jen is on it. Good job, Dr. Yeah, Jen got us. <laughs> I'm here from the background, I'm taking care of it. Perfect. Um, okay, so we're gonna jump in, um, just sort of situating all of our understanding. These are words that we uh, use a lot in counselor education and higher education. Um, and it's really just sort of something people assume is understood. Um, and I'll also just share, I'm a, a first generation college student um, and my parents are still not quite clear on what any of these words mean and, and what it means when I'm stressing about like my tenure dossier. So um, I still sometimes come across information that I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. Um, so that's another reason that we think um, this is great information to have access to, especially if you're not, not yet on the job market or new to the job market. Um, so on the one side, we have non-tenure track jobs, and this is an all-encompassing term um, to mean basically that work that is accomplished on this track does not count towards tenure. Um, this includes adjunct visiting and clinical track or teaching track or professional track jobs. Um, 
the AAUP refers to these positions as contingent positions um, and that their common characteristic is that institutions make little or no long-term commitment to faculty holding these positions. And we will talk a little bit later as we get into each of these specific positions. Um, there are some trends um, for the better with regard to non-tenure track positions that actually uh, we were just talking about the other day. Um, so the important word I think there is contingent, it's, it's we wanna notice that AAUP is sending a message um, to indicate certain things, but that we are not necessarily, we do, are not necessarily in support of the fact that we should refer to anybody as contingent because we all know non-tenure track people are essential to making a higher education run and certainly a counselor education program run. Um, ours would not function without our non-tenure track faculty. Um, and then on the other side, we have tenure track. Um, and so work accomplished on the tenure track contributes to the opportunity to apply for tenure. Uh, the probationary lengths vary generally between five and seven years um, before you are able to um, be tenured and move from an assistant professor role to an associate professor role. Um, for a long time, my mom believed that me being an assistant professor was a choice and that that meant <laughs> that I was an assistant to a professor. <laughs> so, <laughs> a little anecdote <laughs> that I'd share with you. Um, Yes, thank you for that comment. Higher education does not exist without the most marginalized, underpaid, and overworked faculty, which are adjunct. And we will talk quite a bit about that here in, in just a brief amount of time. I, we'll get there for sure. Um, and so, um, again, just pointing out again, some of these, uh, the ways in which people and organizations communicate about tenure versus non-tenure. On the other side, uh, the AAUP refers to or defines tenure track as a tenured appointment is an indefinite appointment that can be terminated only for cause or under extraordinary circumstances such as financial extingency and program discontinuation. Perhaps most problematically, none of that indicates that a tenured appointment could be terminated for a person being a lousy professor or educator. And in fact, the um... The, the third condition that I've seen on a number of campuses is for moral turpitude. Um, but being an asshole is definitely not one of the conditions <laughs> under which <laughs> tenure can be revoked. <laughs> I thought I was going to be the first one to curse tonight, Colette. <laughs> Boy, oh, you to it. it. <laughs> Okay. Um, and so, um, again, just kind of keeping in our theme to um, shed light on some of these things that some, some people may be like, duh, why are you even showing me this? I know these things. Um, but just to show, and this is relatively recent data, um, the differences in race and faculty rank. And so um, we can see by and large, so these this solid purple bar and this purple bar with the white stripes, this is not, from an accessibility standpoint, this is not great, but <laughs> this is what they used. So this is from um, the NCES and these, this solid purple bar is white men. The purple bar with the white stripes is white women. And so obviously you can see here just the sheer inequities across all um, components of the faculty rank, um, but um, as you can see, the numbers change quite significantly as you move from full professor through down to the non-tenure track um, professor positions, okay? And so you can see how the numbers um, specifically of women increase in those spaces. Certainly um, black women, we see representation increase in some of these um, non-tenure track um, lower paid positions as um, somebody mentioned in the chat, those are certainly um, folks that are being um, not recognized at the levels that we would want to see um, within the tenure track or even the higher paid positions, which is the next slide. Um, so money talks, right? And we can see here the differentiation of salary by rank. Um, and it's pretty surprising. I know, I know Dr. Dollarhide was very unhappy when she saw this for the first time. Um, and we can just see there's a significant jump from associate professor to professor. Um, and then again, if we come back and we center that um, within the context of um, the racial disparities by, um, by rank, then it, this has even more significant implications. 
And, these, and uh, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say that these are representative of a broad range of disciplines. Um, and so uh, that upper line for professor, um, in my experience, is, is higher than uh, what uh, professors in counseling may earn. Yes, um, we did talk also about just to point out most uh, counselor education programs exist inside of a college of education and, and in general those positions are are not as highly paid um, as other areas on campuses, um, with maybe the exception of like a, a, a measurement and statistics type of position, um, and that's because industry pays um, quite a bit more and so capitalism right. So to start off we're going to go over lecturer and adjunct professor positions, so this is sort of the format we will go through each of the types of positions. Um, and so if you have a question that's like burning about a specific type of position, I would say this would be the time to ask that question, um, but then any sort of more general questions we'll hopefully get to at the end. Um, so a lecturer or an adjunct professor position is a on a semester by semester basis, oftentimes in a fee per class type of format. Um, it can be an annual contract um, and it may be is most likely part time. Um, and it may be consistent in topic from year to year. So oftentimes these positions are used for um, somebody who's supervising field work or somebody who's maybe a local counselor who has like experience with a specific group or a specific content. And so they um, are contracted by the university to teach this year over year, um, you know, kind of forever. In my experience, folks in that role usually do hold on to those contracts for quite a while. Um, some of the pros of this is there is freedom, right? It's it's um, not a high commitment. Um, there's scheduling convenience. Um, it can be, um, and this is where I think it's I've seen used most effectively as supplemental income, especially, you know, counselors are able to have their own practice, right? So um, at lecturer and adjunct positions also, also don't always require um, a doctorate. So if that's the case and somebody wants to practice, they are able to hold on to um, uh, supplemental income as well. Um, some of the cons, there's no curricular or programmatic input. So you might have a really great idea um, or want something to change and you may uh, your voice may not be heard. Um, you may not have a seat at the table or likely will not have a seat at the table. Um, no administrative service expectations, which also may could be a pro depending on your position on those things. Um, but also limited advancement opportunities. Um, the, the salary is, is sort of fixed by the university or the college that you're going to be in. Um, the fee they pay per class is, is sort of a steady rate. Um, and then accreditation complications. So oftentimes uh, programs will load up on adjuncts, um, which don't meet the requirements for KCREP um, or make it a little bit more complicated. Um, there is often, it, the pay is low. Um, relative to the amount of work to to properly really be engaged with education um, and then it may not and probably would not include benefits unless that was negotiated um, in a another situation and so some of these social justice implications for this um, is that this uh, type of position may keep faculty from having power or a voice. Um, it may be a way to keep someone sort of engaged with the program, but um, sort of send a message to stay in their lane and not problematize things. Um, it's oftentimes held by junior colleagues um, and sometimes um, folks are asked to do in the, the programs ask people in this position to do more than what's in their contract. Um, and so, and then sometimes it's seen as a negative to uh, set your boundaries and adhere to only what's in your contract. Um, according to NCES, um, lecturers are paid less than instructors. So we saw that on the slide uh, just uh, before this. Um, and so that's just simply, I actually didn't know that. I, I was surprised by that statistic. So that's just an interesting sort of thing to know as you're navigating, if this is an ideal role for you, then to understand that those words that you would have considered interchangeable, or I would have certainly um, have implications when you may be negotiating a higher salary. Um, so consider that for sure. And then um, it can be a, a position that gives a respite or distance from um, a predominantly white institution or higher education. So if it's, you know, you maintain a practice in the community, but you want some sort of experience with um, higher education and maybe in your area there's not another institution besides a predominantly white institution 
um, this would be a way to sort of have a foot in one door, but also out the door. Um, so that is a that can be a, a positive, um, depending on what your goals are, right? All of this, all of these, it depends on your goals. Um, and so each of these different types of positions, I'm not going to read all of them, but we gave examples from current job postings. I literally went on higheredjobs.com and looked up positions. So probably someone at Iowa has me flagged as potentially leaving my job um, because of that. But um, just oh, okay, um, just uh, to give sort of an ex example, the um, the lecturer one is the one where I saw the most actual salary listed. Um, PhD um, required for this uh, third bullet here. Um, in addition, you can see this third bullet includes um, making sure that somebody attends faculty meetings, workshops, and training as required. Um, and again, sort of you, if we go back to the uh, sort of overview of what this type of position is, um, if you're contracted to teach one class and then you're also being asked to do these other things, that's quite a load for maybe um, not as much money, right? Then it doesn't become reasonable to hold one job while doing this to supplement your income. The expectations or the, un, you know, the hidden curriculum of this um, may be that it's quite a bit more labor than it seems on the, on the outside. Um, and so I'll move on and Dr. Dollarhide will take over. So one of the things I've noticed is that Dr. Chen Hayes has definitely shared you know, that there is tremendous variability uh, in terminology and expectations from campus to campus. So this is, information is just is very general. We're trying to kind of paint a broad brush, but it also highlights how important it is to um, research the campus that you would be going to because those campus variations can mean a tremendous difference in all of this information. Um, so visiting professor is a uh, also a kind of a common non tenure track, but a way to get your foot in the door um, and and prove to them how amazing you are if if you're interested in tenure track and then um, you know see if there are and then you're kind of there if there are other opportunities that you are interested in. Um, so it, with a visiting professor, it can be one year or multi-year. Um, it is, um, I've never seen it designated as tenure track, but I'm not going to discount that it could never happen. Um, and because the work that you're doing doesn't count toward eventual tenure, uh, some people uh, use it as an opportunity to try out a campus, try out a community. Say if you're moving with a family, you know, not every community is conducive to the the full uh, thriving of every family. And so this is a way to kind of go temporarily. Um, it, it is usually full time um, and it usually comes along with a lot of the expectations. So um, is it's important to understand how each campus defines this particular role. Um, also, it's real interesting. I've seen um, on in the past, I've seen visiting professor positions say that uh, ABD or uh, dissertation in progress could be uh, acceptable. So this could be a great position if someone is in the process of finishing up all the requirements for their doctorate, um, but also want to start kind of a faculty role. Um, similar uh, disadvantages uh, are to be found in this role also where kind of limited curricular or programmatic input um, and um, often there is uh, no feedback about job performance offered in, in you know in, in a couple of these positions which can be very um, distressing if you're working on developing your teaching and developing um, some of your skills that you feel are going to be important for you as a professor. Um, unclear advancement opportunities, like do you sit there forever and then uh, wait for an opening? Um, uh, that can be very, very frustrating um, and frequently low pay. Um, so some of the social justice implications um, is that sometimes this might be ways that programs bring in persons from uh, underrepresented communities, but don't offer them the protection of a long-term commitment. And in that case, uh, that is, to me, uh, abusive. 
uh, and and not not an appropriate way um, to deal with um, the all important human resources that we know are critical for the survival of a program. Um, there may not uh, be a way to challenge the racist and oppressive structures that exist um, in that uh, in that organization. Um, and it may be somewhat misleading because people then kind of sit and wait for opportunities that may never arise. Um, some examples, uh, here is some wording. Um, here's, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, a description of 24 uh, credit hours. That's a lot of teaching um, per academic year, but 12 and 12 is still uh, in a semester context. That's four classes a semester. Uh, they do expect uh, at service activities, um, developing programs, so reaching into the community, um, but no salary was posted for this particular um, visiting professor position. Um, and then, you know, a second um, one is listed here where, you know, it does say three to four courses, um, but there's also the expectation that this person will be involved in faculty life uh, of the department uh, or the program. So uh, again, you see those variations because there's no one distinct way that this uh, type of job is consistently described. So and I will, oh, <laughs> I was going to say, and I will just add that going forward, basically, there's no, there's no salary <laughs> described for most of them. I was, I was looking, I was trying to sort of cherry pick ones that maybe did have salary, but there really weren't any, but we have resources for how to look up salary um, at the end. Um, so now clinical track or teaching track, and this has a variety, this, these types of positions have a variety of terminology. Um, and so that, you know, these are the ones that we are most familiar with. Sometimes there's like a, a uh, uh, something of practice, like a, a professor of practice type of position. Um, and so these types of positions are also non-tenure track. Um, they usually, they can be multiple years, but they are on a contract basis. Um, there is a heavy teaching or administrative load. So, um, for example, the director of field placement for a given counseling program is oftentimes a clinical track faculty, um, which is mind blowing because we should lock those people in for their whole lives, um, in my opinion. <laughs> um, it usually does not count towards tenure. Um, so if you, you know, for example, are at a university and you have a clinical track position, you're interested in a, a tenure track position, um, the university may not recognize your work on the clinical track as counting towards a future tenure track position. Um, so that's something to be, that's something that's often misleading or mis people are misled about, I will say. Um, it may, there may be promotion pathways. So this is, we were speaking earlier this week about um, the approaches to clinical track faculty, um, at least at our universities, Dr. Dollarhide's in mind. Um, we have noticed that ha there have been positive changes. So for example, at Iowa, um, there are three, five and seven year contracts on the clinical track. Um, there's very clear PNT promotion and tenure requirements. Um, it's very, and uh, Dr. Kasani is saying at her university as well. So there is a trend to um, change these positions to make them um, more clear and less ambiguous um, and a little and more secure. So um, we're seeing some positives there. Um, in addition, there's freedom um, from tenure pressure, especially if you happen to be at a research university. Um, the focus is again on teaching and administrative loads. Um, there's usually a long-term commitment, um, even if it is a one-year contract, clinical positions are usually fairly consistent in a given department. Um, there is a higher teaching load, but that might be perfect for someone who prefers teaching and doesn't love research, right? So that's, um, you know, that's a great opportunity for someone. Um, my husband is on the clinical track here and that was his preference. That's what he wanted to do. Um, he doesn't want to be up all night writing papers, um, which I am a little jealous about. Um, and then on the flip side, um, you, there may not be as much of a voice in uh, campus or program governance. So certain committees may not have non-tenure track faculty on them, um, limited voice or power in programs on campus. Um, it may be low pay. So relative to a tenure track position um, because many campuses do not value teaching as much as they value research and grant writing. And maybe Dr. Dollarhide and I will, I will have a, another webinar about that <laughs> in the future. <laughs> Um, often, uh, another con is that uh, clinical track faculty tend to be evaluated by tenured peers, um, not 
not non-tenured peers, um, which contributes to a power differential and, and some, so this this sort of, that sort of rolls into some of our social justice considerations, given the demographics so of those groups. Dr. I just want to say something, since I'm yes. sort of uh, on the clinical, clinical track, teaching track, whatever this is, um, it's interesting that rank and promotion, right, can be had in this position. At least it's coming around to being that. And I'm sorry if there's a lot of background noise um, all, but the, but in order to get promoted, you oftentimes have to engage in scholarly work, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a, um, that, that's an interesting piece about this is that you can, you can sort of maintain this track for a, a number of years where maybe someone who wants to be tenured, you know, has to go through the process. You have to do this in three years or this in five years. You can stay on the clinical track sometimes for as, as many years as you'd like to. But if you want to, to be promoted um, and ranked at another level, you do have to engage in scholarly work and research, um, which makes it pretty difficult for people who are teaching three, four or five classes um, a quarter or a semester uh, to engage in scholarly work in that way. So that's something to I think consider for this particular track. That's an additional component of the hidden curriculum, right? Because we looked up all of this and, and talked about it. And so, um, and again, I think as we mentioned earlier that that may be different by um, university, but certainly is worth considering because um, research is currency for higher education institutions and it is still a capitalistic society. And so that is, we we're just little hamsters on the wheels. Um, so some social, some additional social justice considerations here. Um, the uh, clinical track may be used to keep um, diverse persons in the program without making a, a stronger commitment to them. I'm noticing now that this is the same as the slide before, and I think I made a mistake. Um, but <laughs> the applications are um, the same. I would say I do know also. Um, the clinical track may not actually lead to advancement. So they may mislead people to get them in the door, especially if they are um, intending to diversify or um, be seen as diversifying their department. They may um, mislead folks in indicating that in the future, we will have a tenure track position open and you are welcome to apply for it, which is the same way as saying, we're gonna have a job opening and everybody can apply for it. Um, so I have, heard and seen that I have mentored people who had that exact experience. I have heard it from many doc students as well. Um, that is, <laughs> Dr. Jalahar is raising her hand that she has had that experience as well. Um, and so another, um, you know, sort of situation where the job postings then also um, indicate a heavy teaching load, but then that, that phrase, other duties as assigned, um, that came up quite a bit in this particular grouping of job postings. And your track, Dr. Dollarhide. And I was just checking, Dr. Levine, and that was not a mistake. They, they, you've, uh, those, those slides were accurate. That was so. Just so you know. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I recognize in terms of time, often people have a lot of questions about tenure track. Um, so um, it, it is really important to recognize, as has been pointed out in the chat, that uh, whether you're at a union campus or non-union campus does have an impact on the um, uh, on the, um, the the reality of tenure and how it's experienced. Um, one of the things about tenure, and I know Dr. Chen Hayes was like, no, um, is um, there is a lot of discourse around whether or not tenure is an archaic concept relative to social justice and that the uh, tenure, um, uh, the pre-tenure phase where you're working like crazy to try to prove to yourself that you're good enough to join the good old boys network, that perhaps it's time that we dismantle that as an example of some of that archaic hegemony that uh, uh, prevents um, full inclusion and participation by all members of our society who, who desire to do this kind of work. Um, so the idea of you know, lifelong employment has sort of uh, outlived the idea of tenure, which was just to protect um, uh, individuals and from uh, who wanted to teach uh, cutting edge and new ideas uh, to protect those um, ideas from being censored. Um, and, and now sometimes since uh, tenure is actually a gate 
to, you know, uh, through which um, only appropriate ideas can be um, can be promoted. So it's it's, it's a, an interesting dialogue about whether or not tenure will will survive. Um, it does um, provide some protection. As a full professor now, I know I have a lot more courage to rock the boat and to um, make points in faculty senate and um, university senate about um, the way that the university treats people. So, you know, once once it, you know you've passed those hurdles, then you you might be in a position to try to advocate more effectively for change and for uh, new ways of looking at things. Um, it, it is difficult for uh, tenured folks to see, um, uh, to, to be reprimanded, if you will. And I've seen, unfortunately, over the years, I've seen some colleagues who, frankly, um, were not um, treating students well, and those people were retained. And I just, that's what personally I find very, very tragic about this. Um, so some of the things that you want to be aware of in terms of, of whether or not you're going um, into a tenure track position is you want to be really, really clear about what are the expectations. What's interesting is that sometimes um, universities that want to move up in those Carnegie de designations of research intensive, et cetera, that even a teaching university can sometimes say, we're going to set these as you know, you know, we're going to up our expectations in terms of uh, research productivity, and and so here are teaching faculty teaching for four um, at a comprehensive university, uh, and are now being asked to really produce a lot in terms of publication and grants. The problem with that is that uh, there aren't the supports in place in order to. Um, foster that kind of, a, of research productivity. And so it, it leaves, you know, faculty sometimes very, very um, anxious uh, about whether or not they're going to be successful. Um, next slide. Thank you. Um, so the, the time frame is really important to recognize and to, to, be, to understand. The best universities will give you uh, feedback as you're going along. Every year you hope that you can, if they don't give it to you, you need to ask for it. F feedback on how am I progressing toward tenure? Because you would have a lawsuit um, and probably be very successful in that lawsuit if you're not given feedback and then you don't uh, happen to get tenure. So um, it is important to understand, do they prioritize empirical work over theoretical or conceptual? Do they prioritize quantitative work over qualitative work? Do they prioritize certain publications over other publications? All of that, what about book chapters? How does that count? How, what, how do books count? Um, how does a grant count? All of that you wanna have as clear as possible as much information as you can. It is um, frequently the case that publication work that you've done before you arrive on their campus is not counted. Frequently, not always, but that's another question. You wanna know the work that I did, I published an article in my doc program, I published three articles in my doc program, You know, will that count? Can I bring those with me toward tenure or not? Because sometimes it does not count. And then that high pressure for publication and research can really lock people up. I had a colleague in, in a teaching university um, and, and he became so anxious that he left, he left the field. Um, it, it just wasn't worth it to him, even after earning his PhD, it wasn't worth it to him to stay in a tenure track environment because it was uh, during the time that this comprehensive university was really pushing for more and more and more research productivity. Um, I think, Colette, if you don't mind, I think just to also mention, so like Research One universities definitely are a tremendous factor in this problem, but some of those universities, as Dr. Dollarhide mentioned, that are trying to make the switch and they'll talk to you about it on their interview process and in their, and if you start hearing those words, as, as I know a number of people who like were, they didn't want to research one job, they went after a research two, they went after a teaching job, and then all of a sudden it they were in this completely different position. It's actually happening to a friend of mine right now 
um, and she's looking for another job because she all of a sudden was without the resources expected to submit these crazy grants and all of these things. So that's almost worse um, because then you think you're safe. You think you've gotten into this, you know, space where you're going to your, you know, contribution contributions are going to be valued um, as they are, and then and then they aren't. And so, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but it's just currently happening in front of my face to somebody. Right Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, Dr. Chen Hayes also was pointing out that you want to know, um, are there publications, certain publications that are better, um, you know, the impact factor, not all counseling journals have an impact factor and yet can have a profound effect on our profession. So it, it when, when your uh, dossier is being evaluated by people who are not in your discipline, you may need to add additional information so that they understand, you know, that this is, uh, this journal is not ranked, but is also, but is uh, a national journal, peer reviewed, et cetera. Um, public, uh, presentations, how do they count? You know, all of those kinds of questions. Um, so because it, the information, it's not deliberately being obscured, but sometimes campuses don't articulate it and yet they hold expectations that are not communicated effectively. So if your own department chair is not um, sharing this information, you can reach out to the chair of the PNT committee or former chairs of the PNT committee if you're you know anxious about not um, alienating the chair. And some PNT committees are jerks. Uh, I'll just you know just say that. So um, it also um, is a um, it can be a very, very difficult conversation that can is fraught with all sorts of emotions. Um, we can go on to the next slide. Thank you. And of course, hazing. Is, you know, a lot of people experience the pre-tenure time as as literally as hazing. Um, I also had a very, very good friend who served as a journal uh, editor of a national journal. And when it came time for him to be uh, go, to go up for tenure, uh, the committee uh, turned him down and he was in his uh, sixth year, his penultimate year. Uh, and so he left that university and found a university that really values him for who he is and what he brings. So it, even though it was a very difficult situation at the time, uh, he has... Um, shared with me privately that he actually believes it was a good thing in his life. Now, I'm not trying to minimize the impact on, on people when this sort of thing happens, but, you know, it happens. So um, uh, sometimes, it, you know, there's lemons and lemonade, right? Um, and um, yes, the there is tremendous power and privilege because this is where you see uh, the white hegemony um, in, in full view. Um, most of the tenure and promotion people are senior people uh, who've been around a long time and they don't look like the persons who are coming forward now for tenure and promotion. And that is a problem. That is a huge problem. Um, and so some examples from current job postings, um, you can see here it's you know, core faculty teaching courses, um, you know, conducting a program of research and publication, searching for external grants uh, in training, research and service. So it's really important to recognize that you want to read these job, these job announcements very carefully. And in the second one, you know, it's the, the full the full Monty here, you know, with teaching, supervising, advising, mentoring, recruiting students, um, enhancing the university, um, as curriculum development, accreditation, scholarly activities, serving on departmental college and university committees. So, um, you know, one of the things that, that I would offer is that as you're thinking about what your, what is, what do you want in your life? and thinking about the quality of your life, which is, this is the most important thing. I'm at the end of my career. I'm gonna retire in two years. And when I do, I'm gonna look back on the years that I missed maybe with my daughter or the things that as a grandmother, I wish I had been able to participate in, you know, the school play and that kind of thing, but I was teaching. So, you know, it's really important to recognize that 
that you have control over your destiny in ways that that not all, not all the prior generations had and that some of these opportunities and options give you ways to to design what what you know what feeds your soul i i wish that i had kept up a clinical practice i didn't i wish that i had kept my clinical skills uh, sharp um i know colleagues who do have private practices and um you know have traded off uh in other ways because they wanted more teaching less research but they wanted to have a clinical experience clinical you know practice going to to create community clinics to contribute to the community in profound ways and and that is every bit as important as some title of professor or whatever so what we hope what we hope is that you'll be excited about your future um in ways because you're informed about what the options look like that that none of these is less than any of the others they all contribute to the really important work that counselors need to do um and it's a way to be able to have a voice in academia and the training of new counselors to teach them about social justice so that when they get into their counseling experience they understand how to um, how to fully embrace all of the identities that their clients bring in. So, um, are there? I know that there's more slides, so I don't want to. Okay, okay, we'll go to the okay. Oh, sorry. I think well, we. I think um, I saw and Jen. Uh, I can see your face, so I wanted to take a moment for you to be able to jump in. I know there was. I can't keep up with the chat. I can't read this. The text is too small. <laughs> Oh no, I have a couple of, uh, I have a, just a couple of questions, you know, that I told people I would keep track of for the question and answer portion. So I've got those going um, and we'll get there. Yeah. Well, why don't we, I mean, it's 10 to, so why don't we jump into those now? Everyone has access to these uh, slides and then probably some of what we say will be some of the tips and ideas. Um, and I just quickly will say, if you go, if we go through, um, this is a very lovely curated list um, all in one place with links. Um, so that you can access all of these different resources um, that, you know, as you as you need, um, as you go through the process, because right now it might seem like, you know, up here and it's not really affecting you right now, but in the future, probably going to be something you want to revisit and um, engage with and click on those links. Um, but go ahead. Let's hear the questions. So um, Stuart posted something that I, I'd like to be spoken about because there, I'm making an assumption are plenty of doc students probably sitting here right now. Um, and doc students being used as, you know, used as faculty, let's say, without power uh, and equitable, equitable-ish is what I sort of read from that treatment um, within, you know, within the full faculty, right? That's what I, that's what I understood, Stuart. I don't know, to clarify, because this was your statement and I said, I'd love for you to talk about it if you had energy. Um, so I just made a little note of it. Sure. Um, well, good evening, everyone. I'm sorry that I was late. Uh, it's really fun as one of the founding parents of CSJ to watch what the organization has evolved into. And gosh, I wish I'd had this when I was a doctoral student. So I appreciate you all very much. Yeah, I'm like the queen of uh, Zoom chat. So uh, I uh, put a bunch in there. But higher ed is really uh, about making money whether we want to talk about it or not. And the folks at the top are counting beans and they're actually really, really focused in most institutions on getting as many people to do as much work for as little money as possible, which is really frustrating to hear, but it's the truth. So our most vulnerable are our doc students, our adjuncts, our lecturers, our clinical and teaching faculty. Um, and the folks who have the most goodies are the, the full professors, and the folks who are fighting to get up to full professor, but so many institutions don't want to give people full professor positions because it's cost so much more. So we have an entire profession with lots of people stuck at associate because institutions are just not willing to, uh, to cough up the bucks. So um, I become very involved in our union and I encourage all of you to be very connected unions. I actually now teach about unions in our graduate and master's level courses because no one ever did that. 
And so I encourage people to be incredibly well connected uh, to unions and that struggle. Um, and wherever you're at, to know that it's still struggle all the way through. And I think it was Tevin who, if I'm saying the name correctly, put in, you know, if you want to do critical work, which I do constantly, find institutions that are going to love you. Find places where, in terms of your multiple identities, you're going to be celebrated and supported. And you know from the word go that you're going to have permission to open your mouth be it in class or on Twitter, wherever you choose to do it and go for it. I think that's I think that's important for doc students to hear because there's so much, I'm speaking from somebody who got it 10 years ago, right? I got my PhD 10 years ago. And I just remember the feeling of, I need to put so much on my CV, right? In order to become a professor of whatever standing, right? Like I need to put so much on my CV. And so how do I say no to teaching? Uh, if, even if they're asking me to teach two classes a semester, right? And this is for my development, this is for my, and then they want me of course to, to do external research also to a dissertation, right? And so, you know, how many conferences can I attend per year? And so this is a lot. And I don't think now looking back obviously, and thank you Stuart for saying, um, I think I got valuable experience, but I also know that I was saving university money <laughs> at the end of the day, mm -hmm. right? Because they didn't have to hire an adjunct, even an adjunct, right? Whenever doctoral students were teaching some of the classes. And I know I needed that experience. I know I needed it. And I'm so glad I had that experience. But now I also consider that they didn't have to hire somebody else, right? To do that work. Um, and so I don't know if I have such a great solution for doc students right now, but I do know that the balance of you know the work-life balance only gets harder whenever you take take one of these um, positions. So learn work-life balance while you're a doctoral student, and it's okay to say no to things. You are you are a student. You are paying money to an institution to get a degree to learn as much as you can, and so you do. You can set boundaries and you can say no to experiences. Right? You can say no. And I think, um, and this is something actually Tevin is, is at Iowa and we have actually discussed this before, but um, something, and I didn't even consider um, until this past year is um, if you are offered an opportunity that's on um, a project that is paid, which everybody tells you to say absolutely yes to because money on your CV is always good on your CV. Um, if you don't know where the money came from and what that means for the work that you are allowed to do with that money, um, that is something to be highly aware of. Um, so government agencies are, higher education institutions are um, government agencies. And so um, sometimes the money is uh, tied to a particular politician's agenda. Um, and therefore you can be um, uh, censored the word I'll use there. Um, and so I think that that's and related to your, your question, Tevin, I think that's an important consideration about doing critical work. Um, sort of if you're doing your work and you're um, doing good work that's recognized in academia um, and the institution can put their name on it, um, <laughs> they're, they're not going to stifle you as much, I think. Um, and so definitely understanding that dynamic is, is the learning experience I just had. So I will share that with you as I'm going through it. My doc students who are here all know it. So um, I talk about it pretty openly. Um, I see, Jen, what other, did you have other questions that in the queue? Because I'm seeing a couple others come in too. There was, and there was a big thing rolling down the hallway. So, oh my goodness. Okay, <laughs> I'm so sorry. So Carrie asked a really amazing question, I think um, about protection against like freedom, freedom of speech, let's say. But Carrie's question was, does tenure help protect against political mandates, such as those against CRT, um, also job security, freedom of speech protection? Does tenure protect against those kind of situations? I don't know that answer. I know Stuart, Dr. Chen. I hope so. Me. Yeah. Um, uh, I know that, that that one is also a choice of conscience, and um, I would never let that stopped me from doing what I know to be right, so. Yeah, agreed. Uh, 
tenure is not a license to be oppressive uh, to others, and there are multiple systems of accountability around that. But the reality we also know is that privileged folks often uh, support other privileged folks not to be accountable. So across multiple identities, you want to find your allies, not only within cancer ed mm -hmm. programs, but especially outside them, because you never know when you're going to need them on campus. Those are the questions I took note of, and I know there's a whole bunch more now that I just could not keep up with. So if you have, Allison, that'd be great. <laughs> I saw um, uh, Chantel said, hi, Shan. Um, in what ways do you think those on the PNT track can speak up about the hazing process? Um, so, and I think it's different by university. So now I'm at my second R1, and I will say um, the experience is very different. Um, in a way that I wouldn't have expected. I would have expected it to be more intense at Iowa as compared to Kentucky and it, it the opposite is true. Um, and so I'm just airing out institutions. So whoops, but, um, <laughs> um, but I will say, um, I think you can, I, and I think what what's probably the best way to address this because knowing that a lot of these are doc students who are here, who are going to be on the market is how do you find out about the hazing process or the degree to which, um, non-tenured or pre-tenured faculty are treated um, sort of on in the questions that you ask when you're interviewing or um, finding out more about um, a university, um, because I think a lot of people aren't going to necessarily tell you about the hazing that they're experiencing, and it might be hard to find out that information. Um, and Colette, you're shaking your head, so I'm going to turn it over to you to speak more about that, I think. Sorry. I feel like a little dog in the back of the car. <laughs> But I, I very much agree with what you're saying. I have been on um, two different R1 unit campuses and uh, very, very different in the ways that they treated the, the persons in the tenure seeking process. Um, and so, um, you know, one campus uh, is, is very supportive, has mentoring, has, um, you know, assigns people, you know, to, um, to, a mentoring relationship, which gives them support and insight. Um, also, every year, very, very careful with feedback on progress toward tenure, knowing that it is a contractual issue. And so, you know, no campus is perfect. That's for darn sure. But um, I, I do like the way Ohio State does it. I, you know, I do find that to be less horrible um, than than uh, other universities that I've been at. Yeah, and I, I think an easy one is just sort of a formal mentor program makes all the difference in the world. Honestly, as as pre tenure faculty, I know that's something that exists in some places and not other places. Um, when you start um, or when you're talking about this with uh, chairs and search chairs, you you know that's immediately just asking what supports are available for junior faculty or non tenure track faculty will tell you a lot um, and. Shan, for you, I'll be right there with you to problematize any and all offers that you get. So don't worry. <laughs> we'll we'll find out all the nitty gritties before we make any before you make any decision. Let's see other questions. Anybody want to say with their voice any questions that they have? Sophia mentioned something in the chat about wanting to. And Sophia, I'm going to try to say this, but please come off and say it if you have the energy to do it. Um, can we recommend an institution in the chat that offers a more supportive experience for adjuncts? Um, I'm affiliated with the university, but have no financial interest in promoting it. Just wanted to share an experience. So I said, yes, I think this is a space to share because we want to help each other figure out this process. Um, but I wanted to make sure that that was the collective decision of the group before Sophia shared. Sounds good to me. Me too. Um, and so again, just any other we I know we um, had talked about an hour is sort of constraining and this is such a great um, and surprisingly large group. So um, anybody who wants to come off the chat and just or come off the um, mute and just ask any questions. Um, we're here to talk about whatever you'd like. I'm seeing, okay, Carrie's saying, how much do I need to worry about ageism? Oh. Give context, I'm an mm -hmm. older doctoral candidate with 26 years of school counselor and 10 years of a part-time practice. Will yeah. a university want to invest in someone in their early 50s? Absolutely, I'm sorry. The, nope. This is one field where you can age gracefully in place. 
Mm-hmm. You know, and, and and that that experience and that credibility often um, can and that experience. Oh my goodness, it's worth its mm-hmm. weight in gold. That's been that's been my experience. Um, so I I would say, you know, what you what you have is that um, uh, ability to speak uh, with confidence about the field in ways that other people cannot. Mm-hmm. So. I've been on search committees where somebody with pages and pages and pages of a CV, but was fresh out of a doc program, um, was overlooked for somebody with, you know, three or four publications, but extensive work in the field um, over many, many years. So I would agree very much. Um, that's what, and that's what our students want, honestly. Um, as Colette mentioned earlier, sometimes you sort of make a trade-off when you decide to become a counselor educator. And sometimes even like I'm relatively early in my career, right? And I sometimes get nailed with some questions about my experience. I look young, that's, I have an ageism issue myself. That's why I wear my glasses actually and not contacts anymore um, so that I can look a little bit older. <laughs> but <laughs> in a couple of years, I'll be kicking myself for that, right? But um, <laughs> that's definitely what students want. They wanna know about your experience. Um, I'll call out, Ashan was my uh, TA for class last semester and our students only wanted to hear about her clinical experiences. Um, they did not care about what I was saying. They wanted to hear about exactly what Shan was experiencing in her practice like the week before. Um, Siley is saying, we looked at the data in the start about race and ethnicity of faculty in CE. How does that look for individuals from LGBTQ communities and people with disabilities? Well, if the NCES thought about it, <laughs> they did not decide to collect that data. I, have, um, I was on a dissertation committee a couple of years ago um, looking specifically at the uh, roles of people with disabilities in higher education. And I, I know that he, he was an ed policy student and I know that he was struggling significantly to find that data. Um, so I don't know that that data exists. And in a national way, I'll say. Yes, and Stuart is right. The cave crap categories are not good. They, they don't, they're not comprehensive at all. They just look at race and gender. And, and binary gender, I believe even. Um, okay. okay, so Sophia has shared. Wow. Yeah, let's move to Canada. <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> My face just lit up whenever I read that. I was like, what is yeah. going on here? <laughs> Boy, <laughs> that is great. Yeah, no kidding. I was going to say, you know, um, yeah, that, that is absolutely amazing. That, that sounds like, you know, and one of the things that, that COVID um, uh, gave us an opportunity was to appreciate our um, online colleagues in ways that we never would have, I think, otherwise. Um, my, my daughter also uh, did her master's in school counseling at Capella and had an amazing experience. Um, and I was like, wow, you know, um, so um, I have, I have, re- you know, tremendous respect for our online colleagues. Online is also different <laughs> than on ground. And having taught in both of them, there are some elements of online teaching that are definitely a little more, you know, Feel more pressure around it than whenever you're teaching on ground, um, but that can be a separate discussion for another webinar about the difference between on ground and online. I think. <laughs> yes, I think Dr. Chen Hayes had something also. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you all uh, mention uh, Mark Pope tonight? You did not yet. Well, I'd like to. I did it uh, in the chat. I'd like to dedicate tonight to Dr. Mark Pope who unfortunately died from a heart attack earlier this week. Mark was a former president of the American Counseling Association. He was in on the original meeting of the founding of Counselors for Social Justice, a huge ally. Uh, He was the first ever out gay uh, president of a major mental health association, the American Counseling Association. And he was an indigenous elder. as well as an extraordinary professor of career counseling. So I thought it important mm-hmm. that we mention Mark's passing because he was a huge guiding force and the reason that this group is in existence. Oh. I, I didn't, haven't seen any information. I'm 
I'm sorry to hear that he's passed. He was an amazing, amazing professional. It's on LinkedIn. Um, uh, a number of folks have made some comments there. I haven't seen the other messaging out of ACA. I know they've done some this week. Uh, but yeah, I thought it important that, that folks know. Are there any other questions that anybody were just over the hour? So just try to be mindful of social lives of folks. I imagine after this webinar, you guys are going to be like, I need a drink. I really need a drink right now. <laughs> so... <laughs> One more, if I may. Um, I put my uh, Twitter handle in the chat. We have an extraordinary community of school counselors, school counselor educators called SC Chat. And if you are not a school counselor, um, you can certainly use Twitter as well. But we have organized incredibly as a school counseling community on Twitter. And I don't know if there's a Twitter for doctoral students in counselor ed. There should be. But even though there's lots of wackiness with it, I just celebrated my eighth year anniversary. I don't do any other social media, maybe a little bit of LinkedIn. But if you want to find uh, where things are really hopping in counselor ed, uh, extraordinary number of uh, counselor educators of color as well on board. Um, there's just really great stuff going on. So create an account and join us. You don't have to post a lot. You can just follow. But if you really find, want to find where a lot of the activism is right now in the field and some, I think, the most creative out there voices, folks, whether they're pretend you're not doing amazing stuff, uh, join us on Twitter. If you want to see Dr. Darius Green just shred up some people, find him on Twitter. <laughs> Ah, oh, I love Flip it. Flip the table. Flip the table. That's what we need to do. Sorry. You all, I am so grateful um, for your words. Can we give some silent praise and applause to our presenters tonight who have done a phenomenal job to give us a little bit of insight Yay. into this hidden curriculum, this hidden agenda um, that is a part of our counselor education career. So thank y'all. Um, I feel like anyone from any area of higher ed could benefit from this speech. So, so thank you for your time. Um, and thank you all for coming out and participating uh, in our webinar this evening. Just so you all are aware, um, Counselors for Social Justice is always looking for more people to be involved and to engage with different voices all over and across the expanse of our work. So if you love this webinar and you want it to be a part of even more opportunities, I invite you all to uh, go to our website to email us um, at uh, counseling-csj.org um, or email info at counseling-csj.org uh, to be a part of everything that is happening inside of our community. Um, we'd love for you all to continue to be a part of um, making this even more accessible and expansive. Um, I'm, I'm really looking at those of you who um, had a little bit of the issue. Well, we had some technical issues with our closed captioning. So I'm really, really attentive and, um, and doing our best to, to even engage that much more. Just so you all know, there is a lot of fun things happening. If you have not read our president's uh, note about Black History Month and a, their acknowledgement of Black History Month, I encourage you to go to our website and read it. It is fantastic and phenomenal. Dr. White is doing the good work um, to represent this division. So go there, read it, um, and get pumped up because it is 365 days of Black history here in CSJ. I also want to invite you all to um, our upcoming event, which is our Professional Development Institute on Friday, February 24th. It is a half day of wonderful experience and work. Uh, so if you want to get up to five different continuing ed credits, uh, I encourage you all to come, be a part, uh, keep an eye on your emails that is coming out soon. Um, and of course, in our chat, you have seen the CE survey. So make sure you fill that out for your CE credits. I'm seeing that some of y'all are having some issues. So give me just a second uh, to open that up. 
Um, but make sure you open up the link and save that link. And I will make sure that everything is accessible for you all uh, in just a moment, okay? So thank you all for all of your work. Thank you all for everything that you have done. And I hope you have a wonderful Friday night. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, so